This is Jimmy Powers, ready to bring you another story from The Tumult and the Shouting. Hi there, this is Jimmy Powers with another chapter from the colorful life of the late and great Granny Rice. Today we go to the racetrack with Granny. He takes us down the years with the great and near great horses he knew, plus an interview with the jockey Rice rated at the top of the heap for many years, Earl, the handy guy, Sandy. So with a bow to the spirit of Granny Rice, I pick up his narrative in first person. <laughs> The first time I ever saw Man of War was at Jamaica Racetrack outside New York City in 1920 where he was entered in the Stuyvesant handicap at one mile. I had taken along an old boy from Tennessee who knew nothing about the track. Can you give me a winner, he asked. Yes, I replied, a thing called Man of War in the fifth race. I had him, said my friend after the race. He won, but he didn't pay much, did he? No, I replied, but he won. Man of War was in all books at one to one hundred, or one penny on each dollar wagered. My friend, a plunger, had risked five dollars on the nose. His winnings didn't pay his car fare back to Tennessee. Checking back on the great horses I've seen in action, the question comes back, who was the greatest? My pick would be, first, Exterminator, for speed, stamina, endurance, and most running. Second, Man of War. No faster than Citation, but he had a furious desire to win. He had more color than any horse. Third, Citation. That's the solid horse, always dependable. His later defeats by Noor, though, brought him down a bit. Fourth, Count Fleet. The high-headed colt was probably as good as the best, as fast as any. Didn't quite last out his three-year-old term, however. But the mostest horse, the thoroughbred who gripped the imagination of racegoers, whether they bet him $100 to win or two dollars to show, was Man o' War. You know, the British stud books uh, refused to acknowledge him. They didn't rate his breeding pure enough. This business of breeding, incidentally, makes me snort. When I'm trying to pick a horse, I don't ask about his breeding. All I ask is about six inches of his nose in front of the wire. I've had my first speaking acquaintance with running horses back in 1901. Down the years, I've witnessed perhaps half a dozen great match races, or at least for purposes of description, they were match races in that it was strictly horse against horse. The Man of War John P. Greer affair at Aqueduct Park on Long Island in July 1920 on a weather clear, track fast day was a corker. It was the Dwyer Stakes at one and one eighth miles. This pair scared the rest of the expected field back to the barns. John P. was in with a feather at 108 pounds, while Man o' War carried 126 pounds, including Clarence Comer, in the irons. Well, Aqueduct was a giant beehive. As these two magnificent thoroughbreds came out onto the track, they were cheered like a pair of heavyweights, touching gloves before round one of a world championship. They're off, roared the crowd, as the barrier snapped and two freight trains roared by the stands and into the far turn. At the three-quarter pole, Man o' War was lapped on John P. about a half length. And that's how it was, right through until they hit the head of the stretch a quarter mile from home. 
Right there, John P. Greer made a lung-cracking challenge. It was head and head, neck and neck, as they thundered towards home. Suddenly, about 200 yards from the wire, the smaller horse seemed to go to pieces. Man o' war with that gigantic stride, it measured 27 feet between leaps, kept right on rolling to win by two or three lengths for a world record of 149 and one fifth. That's one minute, 49 and one fifth seconds. Great as man of war was as a champion, I must cast my vote for exterminator when judged in all three directions, speed, stamina, and time, the time he lasts. And man of war was retired to stud as a three-year-old. Because he was a gelding, exterminator's owner, Willis Sharp Kilmer, ran this gentlest of horses from 1917 until mid-June of 1924. That's a total of seven racing years, or more than twice what man of war faced. And in those seven years, he was carrying high weight from 135 to 140 pounds. Yet under this extreme burden, he won 50 of 100 races before he retired. Why the prettiest horse on a Coney Island merry-go-round doesn't pack as much weight as did old Exterminator. As a papa, Man of War's stud performance was as spectacular as was his racing career. From 1924, when his first batch of colts went to the races, Right on until 1954, that's 30 consecutive years, the magnificent patriarch of Faraway Farms, that's near Lexington, Kentucky, sired winners of many races. Their earnings totaled more than three and one half million dollars. And his number one son was War Admiral. Ladies and gentlemen, when a champion steps down, the saying is, they never come back. Well, here in the studio is one chap who has returned to the winner's circle 21 years after riding his last winner and calling it quits to a long and brilliant career as America's number one jockey. Earl Sandy shucked off his boots and his silks back in 1933. Then on October 14, 1954, after a rough period of reconditioning his body and his nerves, Sandy smashed through on a three-year-old filly, Miss Wheezy. The horse paid $27.10, and the second horse, the odds-on favorite, was ridden by a fellow named Eddie Arcaro, who was considered the Earl Sandy of the present day. And now, standing beside me, is Earl Sandy himself, who was a good friend of Granny Rice's. I certainly was, Jimmy. I had the extreme good fortune to be a close friend of Granny's from 1920, right up to Granny's farewell in July 1954. Mm -hmm. I remember just a couple of days before he passed on, we were both coming out of the mutual pit with a $5 ticket on different horses, I don't think either one of us had the winner. Mm -hmm. Well, you must have discussed horses uh, during your acquaintanceship with Granny, all types of horses. We know how Granny felt about the relentless power and drive of a man of war, but you were there. You rode Big Red. Would you like to tell us about it, Earl Sandy? I was there. I had the great thrill of riding Big Red one time. It was in the Miller Stakes at Saratoga, a mile and three sixteenths. And I remember before the race, just before I mounted, I said... Mr. Riddle, you want me to let Big Red run and break the track record? He said, oh, no, Earl, he just let him go out there and gallop around, which he did. <laughs> How did it feel to be aboard him? I, was it like, a, a, I think you once said it was like being aboard a runaway locomotive. Well, he was a big, powerful horse and loved to run. He was, a uh, matter of fact, he was quite a handful to ride. He was uh, very anxious before a race. They had to lead him to the post and turn him over to an assistant starter, and of course we didn't have any stall gates in those days, and any time he straightened up the right way of the track, he was on his way, assistant starter and rider and all. <laughs> but uh, after the race was over, he'd come back and uh, just like an old saddle horse. Mm -hmm. Earl, uh, in addition to Man of War, of course, there was uh, Sea Biscuit and Stagehand. What did you think of those two horses? Well, they were wonderful horses, and uh, I remember the greatest thrill I ever had as a trainer I trained Stagehand when he won the Santa Anita Handicap and beat Seabiscuit a nose. As a matter of fact, I didn't know whether he'd beaten him or not till they hung up the number. It was a photo finish, and he just barely did beat him. I guess I would have settled for a dead heat. Mm -hmm. it, was, it certainly was a thrilling race, a $100,000 race to Santa Anita Handicap. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think a lot of people listening would like to know because they're worried about weight problems, and that a jockey makes his living with his weight. Uh, how about reducing? Uh, doesn't that well, take a lot out of you? Yeah, that's right. My line on that is, Jimmy, that in order for me to make the weight of a rider, I had to be dehydrated, 
overworked and underfed in order to make the weight, and that's a kind of a bad combination, don't you think? Mm -hmm. you it's pretty tiresome anyway. <laughs> hunger gnawing at your stomach 24 hours a day for a year on end. That's right. You work up a terrific t appetite and can't satisfy mm -hmm. it. What were you uh, under, would you say, your normal weight? Had you not been a jockey, would you have been about five pounds heavier, 10 or 20? Oh, I, uh, the last time, you remember when I staged that little comeback and uh, rode a few races, uh, 1953 that was, I weighed 138 stripped uh, a few months before, I, and I got down to 111 stripped, so you can see how much, how much weight I, I took off. off. Earl Sandy, you've had a lot of spectacular spills. What was the closest call you think you had? Well, I had, uh, speaking of Saratoga, the worst fall I ever had was at Saratoga in 1924. I got busted up pretty well. I fell first, and three horses fell over the top of us, and I had what you call a comminuted fracture of the femur and a few cracked ribs and a broken collarbone. Outside of that, and you know, outside that you weren't outside hurt. Outside that, I'm in pretty good shape. Well, Earl, thanks a lot for the chat. And folks, you know now how it was like to ride Man of War, the world's most famous horse. Of course, Man of War died in 1948 at the extreme age of 31. We may never see the equal of this horse, who so completely captured the imagination of those, particularly Granny Rice, who rode full steam ahead through the turbulent 20. And this is Jimmy Powers transcribed saying, so long. <laughs>